Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. The FCC denies a petition aiming to prevent interference from digital repeaters to analog repeaters. A Politico article raises the visibility of the Amateur Radio Parity Act progress as it works its way through Congress. The Military Amateur Radio System, or MARS, is urging all its members to exclusively use computers that are air-gapped from the Internet. Aries teams activate for weather emergencies in several states. We will have a full report. Eagles guitarist Joe Walsh, WB6ACU, records new public service announcements promoting amateur radio. South Africa gains 100 kilohertz at 5 megahertz, while Belgium is warning its amateurs of a major threat to the 70 centimeter band in that country. The IARU Region 1 headquarters is warning its members of possible major VHF, UHF, and microwave spectrum grabs. And an ambitious Arizona STEM Education Planetary Rover project revolving around amateur radio is deemed a complete success. We will have all the details coming up in today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, reports that the FBI wants you to reboot your router now. Australia's own Ono Benshop, VK6FLAB, will be here to tell newcomers to the hobby how to find all those elusive amateur radio operators on the air. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with a long lost archive, the story of the old salt and the hams. Our own Greg Stoddard will be here with another edition of his series on tower climbing and antenna safety. That's all straight ahead as edition number 1005 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Sitting in for Don Hewlett, K2ATJ, who is on assignment, I'm W2XBS, reporting from our headquarters studio in Albany, New York. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where Mother Nature seems to have misplaced spring, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. This is W2XBS. We have late breaking news as we go to air this week. The FCC has turned away a petition for rulemaking from a Michigan radio amateur that asked the commission to amend section 97.205 of the amateur service rules to ensure that repeaters using digital communication protocols do not interfere with analog repeaters. Charles P. Adkins, K8CPA of Lincoln Park, had specifically requested that discrete analog and digital repeaters be separated either by distance or frequency, and that digital repeaters be limited to 10 watts output. The FCC recounted in its June 1st denial letter, released over the signature of Scott Stone, the Deputy Chief of Wireless Telecommunications Bureau's Mobility Division. According to the letter, Adkins had characterized digital repeaters as a major annoyance to analog repeater operators. Quoting, in 2008, we rejected a suggestion to amend section 97.205 subpart B to designate separate spectrum for digital repeaters in order to segregate digital and analog communications, the FCC said in his letter to Adkins. Quoting further, we noted that when the commission had previously addressed the issue of interference between amateur stations engaging in different operating activities, it has declined to revise the rules to limit a frequency segment to one emission type in order to prevent interference to the operating activities of the other amateur radio service licensees, close quote. The FCC told Atkins that Part 97 rules already address the subject of interference between amateur stations, prohibiting, among other things, willful or malicious interference to any radio communications or signal, and spelling out how interference disputes between repeaters should be handled. Quoting again, you have not demonstrated any changed circumstances or other reason that would warrant revisiting this decision, the FCC concluded. Consequently, we dismiss your petition. The FCC did not assign a rulemaking petition number to Adkins' petition, nor invite public comments. 
In other late-breaking news as we go to air, on May 23rd, the U.S. House version of the National Defense Authorization Act that included the language of the Amateur Radio Parity Act from H.R. 555 cleared the House. The following day, a fiscal year 2019 Financial Services Appropriations Bill, also containing Parity Act language, cleared the Financial Services and General Government Subcommittee of the House Committee on Appropriations and now is working its way through the full Appropriations Committee. As a result, the Parity Bill has attracted some attention from outside the amateur radio and homeowners association communities. AWRL Hudson Division Director Mike Lysenko, N2YBB, who chairs the AWRL Board's Ad Hoc Legislative Advocacy Committee, called attention to a recent Politico article that addresses the challenges the bill faces. On May 25th, for example, Politico reported lawmakers are making a multi-pronged push to drive the Bipartisan Amateur Radio Parity Act through Congress and finally bypass objections from top Senate Committee Democrat Bill Nelson of Florida, whose allegiance to his state's homeowners associations drove his panel to yank the bill from consideration last fall. The legislation, H.R. 555, would direct the FCC to let amateur radio operators get around private rules, like those imposed by some HOAs, that keep them from putting up radio antennas. Politico cited a spokeswoman for the U.S. House sponsor of the Parity Act, Representative Adam Kinzinger, a Republican from Illinois, who told the journal that Kinzinger is hopeful that Senator Nelson will see its value. When disaster strikes and the power goes out, like when Hurricane Irma hit Senator Nelson's home state of Florida back in September, amateur radio operators became critical to emergency response efforts, Kinzinger's spokeswoman said. At this point, it's unclear how the Parity Act language or legislation will fare in the U.S. Senate. The measure's Senate sponsor, Senator Roger Ritker, told Politico that it would suit him to see the Senate follow the lead of the House in the matter. I think we've done enough that Senator Nelson's concerns should have been answered, Wicker was quoted as saying. Wicker and Nelson are both senior members of the Armed Services Committee, which will oversee the NDAA. AWRL General Counsel Chris Emlay, W3KD, stressed earlier this month that the Parity Act does entitle each and every amateur radio operator living in a deed-restricted community to erect an effective outdoor antenna, full stop. That is the principal benefit of this legislation. Emily pointed out that tens of thousands of ham radio licensees at present cannot erect any outdoor antenna at all. This bill enables them in the same way PRB1 has enabled hams to address unreasonably restrictive zoning ordinances during the past 33 years, Emily said. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. U.S. Army Military Auxiliary Radio System, or MARS headquarters, is recommending that MARS members migrate to standalone computer systems for MARS radio operations, subject to availability of a dedicated computer. These computer systems, or their associated local area networks, should be air-gapped from the Internet. Army MARS Headquarter Operations Officer David McGinnis, K7UXO, said in a message to members, Although not a requirement for membership at this time, we will continue to make this a condition of certain parts of our exercises. McGinnis pointed to remarks by Cisco researchers in a recent Ars Technica article about VPN filter malware. Hackers possibly working for an advanced nation have infected more than 500,000 home and small office routers around the world with malware that can be used to collect communications, launch attacks on others, and permanently destroy the devices with a single command. McGinnis told Army Mars members that Mars headquarters does not discuss specific cyber threats with Mars members or with the public. We also cannot confirm or deny information about specific threats, he said, adding that he had no specific knowledge about VPN filter malware and no comment on the Cisco report. For communication exercises this year, Mars established conditions for a certain portion of the drill that required use of standalone computer systems normally not connected to the Internet. Mars member and software consultant Steve Hadusik, N2CKH, has recommended that members using the MIL STD data modem terminal communication software employ standalone computers in conjunction with the software as a best practice for achieving a high level of performance. McGinnis also said discussion of standalone computer systems on Hadusik's support forums and their use of communications exercises let Army Mars headquarters weigh in on the discussion. He pointed out that the Mars mission assumes that an internet connection is not available. 
He said used or refurbished PCs are widely available at low cost and could be dedicated to serve a standalone function. The most effective way to protect against threats that come from the internet is to isolate from the internet, McGinnis added. Despite a standalone environment, we assume that all computer systems in private citizens' hands are infected with hostile software code of some sort and are not secured, he said. No amount of virus and malware scanning software changes that assumption. We can, however, isolate computers by disconnecting them from the international network in which hostile software will report and receive instruction. McGinnis said future versions of Mars software will check for an internet connection and will disable the software. We understand this lockout does not provide security in and of itself. Rather, its value is in changing the behavior of members, he explained. He encouraged Mars to monitor for internet security threats and determine how to secure their internet-connected and standalone devices. Mars Program Manager Paul English, WD8DBY, told ARRL that the Mars goal is to isolate Mars members' computers from the Internet as much as possible. Having standalone computers running as few other resources than Mars-related software improves the overall MIL-STD system software performance and further isolates computers from infections, malware, and hacking, he said. English added that isolating the computers that members use for Mars-related activity is a goal but has not been directed. Amateur Radio Emergency Service Teams, or ARIES, in three states activated in the past week for weather-related emergencies. Our first stop is Montana. The Billings, Montana Director of Emergency Services activated the Yellowstone County Amateur Radio Emergency Service Group on May 26th to support radio communication for sandbagging stations and possible river-level spotting duty in advance of an anticipated significant flood event. Yari's Emergency Coordinator Ron Glass, WN7Y, told the AWRL. Glass said the last request from the County Office of Emergency Management called for staffing five sandbag centers last weekend, helping to coordinate logistics and supplies to get tens of thousands of sandbags into the hands of citizens and communities to prepare for the historic flooding to hit the area, Glass said. Blue Creek Fire Department went above and beyond with a homemade sandbag filler, a military surplus vehicle to haul the sand, and a few firefighters. In addition, they went to homes to help residents deploy the sandbags, Glass said. As sandbag center managers, he said, the ham radio volunteers were the only officials on the site, logging in everyone who stopped by to fill sandbags. As we say in Yaris, if you have a radio in one hand, a clipboard in the other, and you are wearing a safety vest, everyone assumes you are in charge, Glass quipped. As it turned out, the record-breaking flooding did not occur, and Ares was able to stand down after three days. 17 volunteers staffed locations along the rivers and bridges that have been trouble spots in the past. Glass said that while significant rainfall did hit Billings, it was not as heavy as initially predicted. River levels dropped on Monday by more than a foot from what had been expected earlier, and cooler temperatures slowed the melt of a record snowpack. By midweek, though, Glass said he was following new severe weather forecasts from the NOAA Storm Prediction Center. Now with more information covering the states of Maryland and Florida, here is our own Will Rogers, K5WLR. Will? In the state of Maryland on May 27th, Aries volunteers in the Maryland, D.C. section activated in the wake of regional flash flooding. Especially hard hit was Ellicott City, where vehicles were washed away by fast-moving floodwaters upward of 10 feet deep. One person died as a result of the flooding. As many watched Alberto, radio amateurs in Maryland watched more and more rain locally. ARRL Assistant Maryland DC Section Manager and Public Information Coordinator Ken Reed, KG4USN, said on Sunday, by 5 p.m., heavy rain as much as 8 to 10 inches soaked portions of central and southern Maryland. The flooding disaster was the second since 2016 in historic downtown Ellicott City, which was still recovering from the earlier event. Section leadership asked radio amateurs in the flood-affected areas to check on the health and welfare of their neighbors. Reed said high water rescues were needed in Perry Hall and Patapsco State Park. When the flooding quickly became serious in several locations, MDC Section Manager Marty Pittinger, KB3MXM, activated Aries in eight central Maryland counties at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and 15 minutes later, more than 40 Aries volunteers reported to their respective two-meter nets in five counties. The majority of flood-effective communities were in Anne Arundel, 
Prince George's, and Howard counties. Amateur radio volunteers in the MDC section provided additional situational awareness and Pittenger interfaced with Atlantic Division leadership. Maryland Section Emergency Coordinator Jim Montgomery, WB3KAS, and state and local authorities. Many county emergency operations centers in affected areas were also activated. Anne Arundel County Aries and Howard County Aries were in communication with their local emergency management agencies and were both told to stand by in case of need, Reed said. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan declared a state of emergency. Conventional telecommunications continued to function throughout the heavy weather, which caused road closures and power and natural gas outages. The MDC Aries volunteers remained on duty until 10.15 p.m. on May 28th. During the activation, radio amateurs made use of VHF, UHF, and HF capabilities, as well as voice over internet protocol modes. In the state of Florida, West Central Florida Section Aries went to a Level 3 activation, or standby, on May 26th after tropical storm warnings went up for the coastal areas of West Central Florida Section counties and for all of Pinellas County. We will continue at the Level 3 activation until the tropical storm warnings are discontinued for all West Central Florida Section counties, ARRL West Central Florida Section Manager Daryl Davis, WT4WX, told ARRL at the time. Alberto shifted away from that part of the Florida coast and came ashore on the Florida Panhandle, moving inland and dissipating, but still causing serious rainfall and some flooding. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. Legendary rock guitarist Joe Walsh, WB6ACU of the Eagles, is featured in a just-released set of ARRL audio and video public service announcements promoting amateur radio. For more details on this exciting announcement, we go to Carl Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. ARRL will provide the 30 and 60 second PSAs to public information officers to share with television and radio stations. The ARRL Media and Public Relations Department also will provide these announcement files directly to interested television and radio outlets. The announcements are available for downloading from the ARRL website for members to use in promoting amateur radio at club meetings and public presentations, such as ARRL Field Day, June 23rd through 24th. The files can be downloaded at www.arrl.org forward slash public dash service dash announcements. Walsh, who visited ARRL headquarters last year to record the announcements, wanted to deliver two main messages, get involved in amateur radio and become a member of ARRL. The messages highlight the tremendous service that radio amateurs provide to communities and convey how ARRL advocates on behalf of amateur radio on a wide range of legal and political issues. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. An ARRL Life member and longtime radio amateur, Walsh personally has been a strong supporter and advocate of ARRL and amateur radio, and his ham shack is just as impressive as his home recording studio want to give back to the hobby that has given me so much enjoyment, he said. The setting for the PSAs was W1AW, which Walsh was especially eager to revisit. The occasion also offered him an opportunity to see equipment he donated to W1AW years earlier. Walsh's past on-the-air forays on W1AW have always attracted enthusiastic pileups. While at W1AW, he spent some time chatting with station manager Joe Garcia, NJ1Q, about the station's operations. Walsh is a well-known collector of vintage amateur radio equipment. Creating the videos were media and public relations assistant Michelle Patnode, KC1JTA, freelance videographer, photographer Chris Zajac, and former media and public relations manager Sean Kutzko, KX9X, who also recorded a tagline for ARRL Audio News with Walsh. Tips for getting audio PSAs on the air are available on the Placing Audio PSAs webpage. Here's one of the PSAs Walsh recorded. 
This is Joe Walsh. One thing I do when I'm not playing rock and roll is get on the air as an amateur radio operator. Also called ham radio is a communication service provided by ordinary people just like you and me. We have a national emergency communication system in place 24-7, 365. Find out more about amateur radio at ARRL.org slash what is ham radio. See you on the air. South Africa Telecommunications Regulator, Independent Communications Authority of South Africa, or ICASA, has included a shared 100 kilohertz wideband at 5 megahertz, or 60 meters, of 5.350 to 5.450 kilohertz in its just published National Radio Frequency Plan 2018 at a maximum power of 15 watts EIRP. The band is being made available on a non interference basis. In addition, ICASA allocated a single channel at 5.290 kHz for 5 MHz propagation research projects. The National Frequency Plan 2018 is a nearly 300-page document that covers the entire radio frequency spectrum. South African Radio League President Nico Van Rensburg, ZS6QL, said the SARL had worked with ICASA to get the new allocation. Clearly, our persistent interaction with ICASA has paid dividends, he commented. This is, however, not the end of the road, as in the new band plan, power on 5 MHz is restricted to WRC15 agreement of 15 watts EIRP. Continue to use 5.290 kHz for a whisper and await the announcement of the 60-meter band plan before operating on the new allocation. The channel of 5,290 kHz has been allocated for whisper beacons deployed in the SARL propagation research project. Due to licensing issues, the SARL has kept low key on the 5.290 kHz beacon project. We now can go full steam ahead, SARL regulatory manager Hans van de Granendal, ZS6AKV, said. There are no longer any restrictions and no application for use of the 60-meter band is required. The chair of the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 VHF UHF Microwave Committee, Jacques Verleyen, ON4AVJ, has highlighted extant threats to the amateur radio spectrum above 30 MHz. In an editorial that heads the latest edition of the IARU Region 1 VHF UHF Microwave Newsletter issued on May 29th, Verleyen invited all IARU member societies to consider ways to promote, defend, and use our frequencies. They are wanted by others, both government and commercial users, Verleyen wrote. So this is a wake-up call to be aware that if we are not using those bands, we will lose them. If that happens, he continued, it won't be the fault of IARU Region 1, but of the amateur community that often has more commitment to HF than to VHF and higher bands. Conceding that the HF bands are the easiest to use, Verleyen said member societies should think outside the box to come up with ideas to improve VHF, UHF, and microwave activity. Verleyen said the vast amount of amateur radio spectrum from 50 MHz through 5 GHz makes it an attractive target for commercial and governmental interests. He noted that 50 MHz is the focus of a key World Radio Communication Conference 2019 agenda item specifically to harmonize the 6-meter allocation across all three ITU regions. It would be unfortunate to see a repeat of the WRC15 result for 5 MHz, where high hopes and years of hard work actually resulted in a few kilohertz at 15 watts EIRP max, Verleyen continued. A repeat of that situation on 6 meters could mean a far more devastating loss of existing spectrum and future opportunities for digital innovation. The 2.3 GHz and 3.4 GHz bands are highly sought after for commercial wireless, Verleyen said, pointing out that the UK recently auctioned large segments of 2.3 and 3.4 GHz spectrum once available to amateur radio, threatening significant activities from narrowband Earth Moon Earth to digital amateur television. Two WRC19 agenda items affect 5 GHz, focusing on Wi-Fi and so-called intelligent transport. 
Amateur radio as a secondary service faces another difficult challenge in this part of the spectrum and has little influence over its direction, Verleyen contended. In IARU Region 1, the primary concern is the expansion of Wi-Fi into 5,725 to 5,850 MHz. Our preoccupation with traditional or narrowband modes does not justify the amount of spectrum, he said, noting that some activity levels are quite low outside of contests. Ideally, we need genuine, open innovation and to show amateurs leading in the 21st century, Verleyen said. Pressures on amateur bands are nothing new, but we know that the spectrum pressures above are not helped by poor engagement, relationships, or lack of a united approach in some member societies with respect to their administrations. Please also remember, united we stand, divided we fall, and be aware and proactive, he concluded. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Whoosh! Coming at you over to radio and the internet. Reboot your router, the FBI says. You don't usually get tech advice from the FBI. They say, reboot your router. <laughs> uh, this is a kind of interesting story. The FBI uncovered a Russian virus called VPN filter that has infected, they say, as many as half a million routers. Uh, I'll tell you the brands, but in, in my opinion, everybody probably should just reboot their router tonight before you go to bed or whatever. Just unplug it, wait five seconds, plug it back in again. That's all you need to do. Shouldn't affect anything, but it will clear out the virus. The virus can only live in memory. And uh, a number of Linksys routers are affected. Microtik, Netgear, QNAP, and TP-Link. I think that's a limited list that is perhaps not complete. Woman in Pittsburgh uh, gave the FBI permission to monitor her network. She had an infected router, and the FBI was able to figure out how the software worked. Very clever. So routers are computers, but they're not smart computers, and they don't generally have uh, permanent storage. So the virus couldn't didn't have a space to put itself. So what it did is it put a little bit, they could store permanently a little bit in the firmware of the routers, of the affected routers. And that little bit loaded the rest of the virus into memory. Rebooting your router just clears the memory out and the router's clean, except that there's that little bit of software which will then try to reload the virus, VPN filter, right? So when in the past, if you'd rebooted your router, it would just reload the virus and continue on. W what is the virus doing? Well, it's not attacking you almost certainly. It's, the Russians don't care about you, but they want to use your router to attack infrastructure and the Internet. And who knows what infrastructure they're attacking. Could be, and we we actually think this is probably the case, uh, like the power grid in the United States. Oh, yeah, get ready because cyber warfare is uh, really becoming uh, going to become a problem. Russians use the Ukraine as a test bed. They've already knocked out the power grid in Ukraine for a couple of hours, uh, kind of a test, using malware. And they've done other things in Ukraine. And this is kind of a test bed for uh, cyber capabilities that they would presumably want to use against enemies. And guess who's number one on the list? It's us. So Fancy Bear, which is a Russian hacking group, best known uh, for hacking the DNC, getting John Podesta's emails, Fancy Bear created this VPN filter it, it's taken over, uh, according to the FBI, half a million uh, routers. I bet you it's more, and I bet you it's not just the routers that listed on the Symantec page, uh, but many more. So I would say take the FBI's advice no matter what router you're using. When you go to bed tonight, unplug it, wait five seconds, and plug it in. The reason I say wait till tonight is you'll take yourself off the Internet briefly, like for a minute or two as the router reboots and starts up again. The reason it's safe to do that now is because the FBI watched what was happening at this Pittsburgh woman's house and figured out that the, that the malware, the little tiny bit of malware that's permanent in your router, was doing two things. First, it went to a, a site called photobucket.com. And this is a well-known site. A lot of people use it to do photo sharing. And there were two malicious images on photobucket. And I guess in the metadata of the image, 
the malware was contained I, is what I gather from the FBI report. Although it's hard to tell, you know, the FBI doesn't, you know, it's not, <laughs> I, I need to see a white paper, you know, something with a little more technical detail, but that's what it sounds like. Somehow they were using these two images to infect routers. FBI took those images offline and also coded into the firmware is, and this was the mistake that the Russians made, Fancy Bear made, is a link to a hard link to a site called toknowall.com. You know, usually malware authors and, and more sophisticated malware, we've seen this, they, they have other means of going out and getting uh, information because the, the problem is if it's hard coded to one site, the FBI can do what it did, which is uh, issued a warrant to, I think it was VeriSign that owns the DNS. Remember we were talking about the phone book lookup, the DNS record for toknowall.com and they took it over effectively severing the link between the virus and your router. So you can safely reboot your router. It will try to go to photo bucket, not find those photos. Then it will try to go to knowall.com and get nothing. And uh, meanwhile, the FBI is going to see every single one of you who goes there and know who's infected. That's why maybe that number is accurate. I don't know. Uh, they, you know, because you're going to go there, they probably can see what brand of router it is and so forth. But for the good news is it won't get reinfected. And whatever bad stuff the uh, Russians planned, Fancy Bear planned, uh, with your router will be uh, thwarted. But boy, this is, this is just the beginning. This is, uh, prepare yourself. We already know that most of the nation's infrastructure, its power grid, is, is, is infected or has been attacked, but in many cases already been infected by malware. Uh, the Russians are, are no different from other uh, high-level hackers. They know how to use your router and other Internet of Things devices. And the, and the real threat is not to you. Yes, your Internet of Things light bulb or microwave oven or router or camera can be used to get into your network. But that's really, they don't care about you. What they want to do is create an army of bots that can be used to attack other things. And with if you have access to a half million routers that can send pings out to a single website, you can bring any site down including those big domain name servers, the phone book of the internet, bring the entire internet down. So you're doing us all a service if you, if you reboot your router tonight. Unplugging and uh, plugging in your router, it might be a good time, you could do that right now, to update your router firmware. I, this is unfortunately something you have to do manually on a lot of older routers. Modern routers should do this automatically, and I would not consider buying a router that did not. In fact, let me broaden that. I would not consider buying any Internet of Things device, any Internet connected device that didn't automatically update itself because you shouldn't have to check one by one to see if your light bulbs, microwave oven, doorbell, router are up to date. But if you have an older router, and most routers are, sad to say, you should check. Make sure you have the latest firmware because one of the things I'm sure router manufacturers will do is patch their uh, routers to make sure they're not vulnerable to this VPN uh, virus. So yeah, maybe a little project for the weekend. Check your router firmware. And next time you buy an Internet of Things device, make sure, check, make sure it automatically updates. And the company's uh, aggressively updating it. That's another thing. You know, you want a good company that's going to update. A lot of these router companies, they make these things, they put them out, and they say, that's it, I'm done. Bye. See ya. That's not good. You know, there are theoretical limits to the number of users that could be on a single access point, but you're not hitting that limit, I think. I think more likely, uh, it's just collisions. It's, as I mentioned, it's, it's designed to be a, you know, a system that uh, is polite and trades off. And I think it's just, I think so many people using it, you want something that can beam form, which is aim at individual users. Not all routers can do that, but, but many routers now, 802.11 uh, AC routers can do that, is beam forming. We, you know, so what do we use? John, do you know if we use ruckuses here or you, we use ruckus? Okay. So in enterprises, you'll see a lot of uh, routers from Ubiquity or ruckus or similar these are expensive. They require some expertise to configure. There's one in here. There's my ruckus right above me. Uh, and so we have a good IT guy. Russell's really good. And he, we have always had Wi-Fi collision issues because not only do we have a lot of users, we're heavy users, right, in the studio and everybody's. And so we have, uh, I think, four or five SSIDs and the ruckuses are doing beam forming. There's all sorts of tricks he's using to make it work uh, reliably. And businesses, and imagine a hotel, you know, where you have hundreds of rooms, hundreds of users, all in the same hotel Wi-Fi network. That's where, those are the places where, uh, where you know, you have to do some special stuff. I think your best bet if you're gonna do this uh, as a home user, 
their most affordable choice is probably going with one of the mesh routers. There's some really great ones out there. I use Zero at home. Uh, I also use Plume at home, and I've used Netgear's Orbi at home in the past. All the three of them will do a very, I think, a very good job of getting through the congestion and helping everybody be able to. It's interesting. He's got, I guess he's got a cul-de-sac or something, a neighborhood. They're all sharing Wi-Fi. That's an interesting idea. You can see the problem with that, of course. Uh, it, the other thing that will work best in a situation like that is using 5G. You know, remember, Wi-Fi can do, originally it was 802.11b was using only one frequency range, that what they call the 2.4 gigahertz range, and that was because it was an unregulated uh, range that anybody could use. Baby monitors use it. <laughs> some, some cordless phones use it. So there's even more interference at 2.4 gigahertz. If you go to the other level, the more modern Wi-Fi routers will also use 5 gigahertz. You'll see them sometimes build as dual band or even tri-band. Tri-band means it has uh, it can use 2.4 gigahertz and two different frequencies at five gig in the 5 gigahertz. It sounds like that's a frequency, 5 gigahertz. It's not. It's a band. It's a range of frequencies around 5 gigahertz. And so there are two different frequency ranges it can use. That's a tri-band router. Using those higher frequencies sometimes works better and i'll tell you why it goes it's physics the higher the frequency of a radio wave the worse it propagates so the megahertz you know radio your radio right now is in kilohertz if it's am and megahertz if it's fm it's at a lower frequency go that's why it works in uh, you know goes through walls goes through ceilings travels great distances a lot of power behind it but it works because it because of the physics of these bands. It can get through walls. As you get to higher frequencies, the microwave frequencies, the gigahertz frequencies, they're stopped more readily. And five gigahertz is much more readily stopped by a wall or door, a roof, than two point four. And and kind of paradoxically, that's might be what you want because then you don't have the collisions. You know, when you're in your little pool of five gigahertz Wi-Fi, your neighbor can't see it. You need a way to spread it. You know, that's where mesh, a mesh network that has multiple access points <clears throat> operating at 5 gigahertz, that might be the best solution because your little pool of Wi-Fi is invisible to your neighbors. That's, that's kind of what you want. You want the isolation. Believe it or not, that avoids the collision problem. Leo Laporte. The Tech Guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio International. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the Propagation Forecast for Friday, June 1st. There is just one spot visible on the sun right now. First it was growing, then it faded and now it's growing again. The solar flux index is hovering around 75, so as a result we've had reports of significant band openings on 15 meters and even a little bit of activity on 10 and 12 meters. There is a decent chance of geomagnetic storms making things difficult over the weekend for events like the Kentucky QSO party. However, if the flux remains elevated, conditions on the HF bands may not otherwise be too bad. It will come down to the strength and the duration of the storms. On VHF and UHF, the bulk of the action appears to be taking place on the east and west coasts. Tropo openings on two meters and above have been popping up in Southern California and Nevada, as well as from Virginia all the way up the coast to Maine. On June 23rd and 24th, Amateur Radio will celebrate Field Day 2018. This is Ham Radio's open house featuring demonstrations of the science, skills, and service that is amateur radio. Hams from across North America will hold local field day events to display the array of equipment and technologies they use for public service and community outreach. For more info, visit ARRL.org slash field dash day. Welcome to the Ancient Amateur Archives. I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. I've previously discussed 
the Clinton DeSoto book, 200 Meters and Down, published in 1936, and indicated it was an excellent history of amateur radio from the earliest days of Spark up to 1936. Mr. DeSoto, W1CBD, also wrote another book about amateur radio called Calling CQ, published in 1941. Here's an excerpt from that book entitled The Old Salt and the Hams. In the radio art, even the professionals are amateurs. A survey made some years ago showed that of the 10,000 amateurs classified, no less than 1,500 were engaged in radio engineering work. Another survey indicated that perhaps 80% of the engineers and operators in radio broadcasting were amateurs, past and present. This applied to many of the executives as well. Even in the early days of radio amateur and professional were considerably intermingled. There was no clear line of demarcation. Experimenters of all kinds, scientists, college professors, distinguished savants who played with radio as a hobby, electricians with the same idea, all were amateurs in the fundamental sense of the word. Later, as some crossed over into professional ranks, they retained their amateur spirit. Most were amateurs who entered the professional radio either in the industry or in government service and are proud of their amateur status. A skeptical naval officer learned this in 1919, shortly after the end of the First World War. His attitude, characteristic of the Navy at the time, was something less than friendly towards the amateurs. Many of the youngsters who dabbled in wireless before the war had better and more efficient equipment that was used by the Navy in those days, and the time after time, they brazenly outperformed the naval radio stations. Occasionally, they caused interference, too, because the non-selective government stations did not have tuners that would reject the signals on other wavelengths. This led some to view the hams as the freebooters of the airwaves, a worthless, irresponsible lot from whom no good could come. The Navy captain in question tended to share this view. He was not openly antagonistic, but he did believe amateurs should be severely regimented. His opinion counted for something, too, for he was in command of vital naval communications work. At the end of the war, Representative Alexander of Missouri introduced into Congress a bill that would have given the Navy absolute control over radio, a government communications monopoly forbidding for private use of the airwaves. Amateurs all over the country who were not in service rose in arms. Their strength was weakened by the fact that many of their numbers were still overseas, however. In desperation, the ARRL sent out appeals addressed to any member of the family of every licensed amateur operator on the lists. Aided by the families of those still in the service, an avalanche of protest was directed towards Washington, and the bill was defeated. The naval captain, sitting there in his office in the nerve center of Navy Wireless, was severely disappointed at no pains to conceal the fact. A civilian visitor suggested that the amateurs had displayed commendable ingenuity in organizing the opposition that had killed the bill. But the prejudiced officer saw in this only additional evidence of low cunning and the general social and moral irresponsibility of the hams. His visitor did not agree. After all, Captain, he said, you must admit that the amateurs helped a lot in winning the war. Ridiculous, the four stripers snapped. What earthly reason have you got for saying that? Why, the fact that most of the Navy's radio operators were amateurs, the civilian replied. What, the captain barked. I don't believe it. Have to look a long time before you'll find an amateur in the Navy. Don't you realize that many of your own staff are amateurs, the visitor argued? The officer snorted. Stuff and nonsense, he scoffed. Then one of his own aides, a lieutenant, who had been listening intently, spoke up. Sir, said the lieutenant, I was an amateur before I entered the service. Coincidence, that's all, the captain retorted. Anyway, that's only one. I was also an amateur, sir, his other aide and ensign said. And a lot of the boys in the control room are former amateurs, too, the lieutenant added. The captain was visibly annoyed. Go out there and bring in any amateurs you can find, he ordered scornfully. If you can find just one amateur, bring him up. I want to see him. One of the aides obediently left the office. There were 30 operators out in the control room, the finest in the service, each at a control position for one of the big coastal stations forming a part of the vast network linking the scattered ships at sea. 
When the aide returned, he was followed by 29, or perhaps it was only 28, of the 30 crack operators in the control room. The captain's office bulged with the horde of men who crowded in through the single door. The captain looked at his men and then at his visitor. The old sea dog's face was too well trained to show surprise, but it was a long moment before he spoke. Well, boys, he said at last, if that's the case, I guess you've got another supporter. If it hadn't been for you and fellows like you, this war might have been a long ways from one right now. And if you're hams, why? Then I'm for the hams. From Clinton DeSoto's book, Calling CQ, 1941. Your time is up. Go in peace. But return again for our next installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. Five new ARRL section managers have been declared elected to begin their first terms of office on July 1st. Section manager election ballots were counted in the Indiana and Northern Florida sections on May 22nd at ARRL headquarters. Other candidates faced no opposition during the spring election cycle. In Indiana, James Jimmy Mary, KC9RPX of Ellettsville, was declared elected in a very close race with Brian G. Jenks, WB9BGJ, the Indiana section traffic manager. Mary received 451 votes, and Jenks of Fort Wayne received 438 votes. Mary has been the affiliated club coordinator in Indiana since 2005 and is presently serving a fifth term as president of the Bloomington Amateur Radio Club. Incumbent Indiana section manager Brent Walls, N9BA, decided not to run for another term after helming the Indiana field organization since July 2016. In northern Florida, Kevin Bess, KK4BFN, outpolled Scott Roberts, KK4ECR, 564 to 447, to succeed current section manager Steve Zabo, WB4OMM. Bess of Edgewater is a northern Florida assistant section manager and a member of the Daytona Beach CERT amateur radio team and of the Florida Contest Group. Zabo opted not to run for a third term of office after serving since July 2014. Oregon also will get a new section manager this summer. David Kidd, KA7OZO of Oregon City, was the sole candidate for the post. He has been an emergency coordinator and assistant section emergency coordinator. Kidd will take the reins of the Oregon section from John Corr, KX7YT of Portland, who did not run for a new term after serving for the past two years. In the East Bay section, Jim Siemens, W6LK, will begin an 18-month term as section manager on July 1st. Because no candidates were nominated by the September 8, 2017 deadline, nominations were resolicited. Siemens of Walnut Creek, California, was the only nominee to succeed incumbent section manager Jim Latham, AF6AQ of Livermore, who has served as East Bay section manager since 2008 and did not run for a new term. In New Mexico, Bill Mater, K8TE of Rio Rancho, will become the new section manager there in July. He too was the only candidate after nominations had to be resolicited, and he will serve an 18-month term. He follows incumbent section manager Ed James, KA8JMW of Edgewood, who did not run again after serving since 2015. Several incumbent section managers were unopposed for new two-year terms starting on July 1st. They are Ron Morgan, 89I, Illinois, Jim Crowley, K1NIT, Maine, Jim Kvachik, K8JK, Michigan, Paul Gayet, AA1SU, Vermont, and Patrick Moretti, 
KA1RB, Wisconsin. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. If you missed Hamvention this year, Jerry N0JY, Vice President of Engineering for AMSAT, had a great presentation. He explained all the Fox Series satellites and the upcoming Golf Series satellites. You can view his PowerPoint or PDF versions by visiting ampsat.org slash question mark P equals 189. Robert KE4AL is one of the recent AMSAT Rover Award recipients, and he is going on the road again. Be sure to put this one on your calendar. During the summer, he has said he will activate 43 grids. For starters, he will activate six grids from July 26th through the 31st. They will be EN 37, 38, 47, 48, 57, and 58. Robert is going to introduce his father-in-law, George, KE0GQX, to satellites and roving. You just might see George on some grid square runs in the future. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. The World Radio Sport Team Championship 2018 Organizing Committee reports that all of the station sites it selected for the July event in Germany are perfect for the competition. After the final check, all sites for WRTC 2018 are now confirmed, a WRTC 2018 news release said this past week. The inspections proved that there are enough very well-suited sites with no topographical or interference problems. The aim of the exercise is to ensure a level playing field for all competing teams in terms of location. Ulrich Weiss, DJ2YA, and Frank Neumann, DM5WF, carefully inspected more than 80 possible WRTC 2018 sites in the region around Mühlberg, Jessen, and Schulterbach. When measuring the angles to the horizon in all directions with a theodolite, we didn't detect a single ground elevation of more than one degree among the occasional rises at the horizon, Weiss recounted. Furthermore, we paid special attention to make sure that the Fresnel zones around the antenna locations are plain and clear of obstructions. Neumann noted that five sites did not meet their criteria and will be replaced with backup sites that they also inspected. Of special interest was the North America direction with its great number of potential DX contacts, he added. Supporting the inspection team were Andreas Thron, DL8UAT, Wolfgang Tretzschock, DL2RSF, and Andreas Winter, DK4WA. In addition to the topographical elevation, all sites were checked for possible interference issues from such sources as high voltage power lines, wind energy facilities, or railway lines. Using an ICOM IC7300 equipped with an active antenna, specifically designed for noise floor measurements, the team checked all sites for any kind of interfering noise. The individual sites are separated from one another by at least one kilometer. Doing these checks in temperatures of well over 90 degrees Fahrenheit was quite a feat, Weiss commented, and occasional bypassers shook their heads when observing a car with a strange number plate and an unusual contraption mounted on its roof parked on the side of the road. He said that driving to all 80 sites in three days covered more than 600 kilometers, or approximately 370 miles. One radio amateur now aboard the International Space Station will be heading home on June 3rd, while another will take his place on the new crew a few days later. Flight engineer Scott Tingle, KG5NZA, will join Expedition 55 commander Anton Skarpalov and flight engineer Norish Kanai in returning to Earth on the Soyuz MS-07 spacecraft after 168 days on station. A few days later, another trio of space travelers, Alexander Gers, KF5ONO, Sergei Prokovov, and Serena Anand Chancellor, will head to the ISS in a Soyuz MS-09 spacecraft. In a traditional change of command ceremony on June 1st, Skarpalov will hand over command of the station to NASA's Drew Fustel, officially starting Expedition 56. In addition to Fustel, Ricky Arnold, KE5DAU, and Olgev Artemev will remain on station. This will be the Horizons mission for Gerst of the European Space Agency, who will assume command of the ISS for the second half of his duty tour. Gerst, who first served on the ISS in 2014, likely will use the call sign PD0ISS for any amateur radio on the International Space Station activities. 
We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Foundations of Amateur Radio Where are all the amateurs is a question that I'm asked regularly by new entrants into our community. The journey most new amateurs go through, and the one I followed, starts with becoming interested, getting a license, buying a radio, setting it up, and then turning on your radio. If you're lucky, you are at this point surrounded by other amateurs, hopefully in a club setting, or you have a friend nearby and you're off and running. The reality is likely that even after a successful first on-air adventure, you'll be on your own in your shack asking yourself where everyone went. I've talked in the past about picking the right day. For example, a Wednesday is likely to have less people on air than a Saturday, but that's only part of the story. One of the things that has never occurred to me until a while after I became an amateur is that listening is a really important way to find other amateurs. Let's start with some things that might not have occurred to you. Most amateurs are not in your time zone. There is amateur radio activity almost all the time, 24-7 on whatever the appropriate band is. Not all bands sound the same. What worked yesterday might not work today. This hobby isn't exact or precise. That is, there are an infinite number of variables which each affect the experience either positively or negatively, and even if you used your radio in exactly the same way, in the same settings, on the same band, in the same location, at the same time, with the same antenna, the landscape around you has changed. The ionosphere is a lot like the ocean, flat and calm one day, storms and waves the next. Those things aside, each of which could be a whole story, is only part of the story of finding other amateurs. There is a tendency for new amateurs to think of frequencies as numbers, as parameters to add to your radio. Pick 7.093 MHz, pick 21.250 MHz, or 28.500 MHz. They're just numbers, things that you pick with your radio, set up your antenna to, and listen. That's part of the story, but there is another part. If you think of light and you go from infrared through visible light through to ultraviolet light and beyond, all you're doing is changing a number, from somewhere around 300 gigahertz through to 3 petahertz. It's a long dial in amateur radio terms, but the difference is just a number, right? It should be obvious that the human day-to-day -day experience of infrared and ultraviolet are completely different. The 28.5 MHz 10 meter band frequency is on the same spectrum as both infrared and ultraviolet, but you don't expect to see these frequencies or use them in the same way. The same is true for amateur radio bands. The 80 meter band, the 40 meter band, 15 meters and 10 meters are all different. They're in use by radio amateurs, but their experience is also completely different. Some are good for daytime communications, others for nighttime. Some work regardless of the solar cycle, others need solar flux. Magnetic activity affects some bands more than others, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. If you have a handheld radio and you're used to listening to a local 2 meter repeater, it's likely that you've set up the squelch on your radio to hide noise, and your day to day experience is one where there is silence when nobody is talking. You might tune to 15 meters and look for the same silence, only to learn later on that noise is what you're actually looking for. The sounds that the 10 meter band makes is different than the 80 meter band. The 20 meter band responds differently to changing conditions to the 40 meter band, and every different radio you use has a different feel. So what you're used to with one radio will be different on another. All this to say that the way you find other amateurs is to listen. You'll need to get a feel for this thing, a sense of opportunity. I've compared amateur radio to fly fishing on more than one occasion. Standing up to your armpits in a river, tossing out a line, finding a bite will be different depending on the day, the temperature, how much you've moved around and the appetite of the fish around you at the time. The more you do this, the more you get a sense of opportunity and the better your results. Instantaneous gratification is going to be elusive. Get used to it, be patient, be curious and experiment. I'll leave you with this image. I'm currently standing in my wardrobe, surrounded by clothes, shoes, boxes and jumpers in the middle of my home with the door closed, crammed in with my microphone stand, a laptop and a tablet, in an attempt to ward off the background noise that comes from a winter storm that is currently overhead, unleashing the first rain of the season in spectacular style. Some days I fantasize that my budget could manage a recording studio, or even a soundproof booth. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. Every year, professional and amateur tower climbers fall to their deaths. In most cases, these accidents were avoidable. Not too long ago, people in my community were shocked when a commercial tower climber fell to his death. According to our local paper, 
on April 21st, Jerry Trammell, 29 years old, not an amateur, of Southern Indiana, fell from an older style microwave reflector tower where he was working with another climber. They were painting the tower. There is no way to prevent all accidents. That's why they call them accidents. As a tower climber, we can reduce them by following some simple safety guidelines. No matter if you're climbing up or down, a simple climbing procedure can dramatically reduce the risk of falling. The cost for this added safety is a slower rate of climb. First off, use the proper commercial climbing belt and attachment gear. Secondly, always wear a commercial climbing shoulder harness. Join the harness to your belt. And lastly, use a similar strap from your harness and attach it to the tower, but always to a different placement on the tower from your belt. This way, no matter which one fails, the other one is more than strong enough to hold your weight and that of your gear and cargo. With a dual strap attachment, you can climb up or down with two straps and always be attached to the tower. Using this method, the only thing that can injure you is a total failure of the tower or a near direct lightning strike. This may slow your vertical movement, but ask yourself this question. If I misplace a clamp, can I flap my arms fast enough to slow my fall to a safe speed? Let's review this simple procedure one more time. You will use two climbing straps to attach to the tower. Always clamp these two straps to different places on the tower, never to the same tower part. From a standstill, unhook one strap and step up one or two rungs until the other strap is around your knees. Then clamp the first strap as high as you can reach. Now, reach down and unhook the lower strap. Step up until the now higher strap is about knee height and reach up and clamp on with the loose one. By using shoulder harness and waist belts and using this method, you will always be connected to the tower while climbing. Remember to follow the dual attachment safety rule while clamped onto the tower when you intend to let go of the tower and lean fully into your belt. Always clamp onto two different places. When using duplicate strap attachments, you effectively reduce the chances of a fatal fall by nearly half. That's a cheap and cost-effective insurance policy you can write for yourself. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The Virgin Islands Daily News reports residents have got amateur radio licenses ahead of the 2018 hurricane season. When Hurricane Irma destroyed cell phone towers and took down landline and internet service on St. John, it left only a single reliable mode of communication, ham radio. Only two licensed ham radio operators were on island following the storm, meeting tasks such as coordinating the delivery and offloading of supplies brought in by helicopter and providing a link between the agencies working on rescue efforts fell to those two guys. Jennifer Rittenhouse Pruce, NP2QT, whose husband, Larry Pruce, NP2LP, was one of those two licensed operators recognized the value licensed ham operators can bring in the wake of a disaster, and she set out to build up the network on St. John. One of the things that became clear was, had we had ham radio operators distributed throughout the island in a better arrangement, we would have an invaluable network of communication, Proust said. It was a technology that clearly worked. In January, Proust began advertising a ham radio class, and by February, 32 people had signed up. Classes then began with the goal of helping island residents earn their licenses from the FCC. Most of those in the class were working toward their technician class license, considered an entry-level designation, while some studied for the general class license. There is already an amateur ham radio group on St. John that meets once a month as more of a social gathering, said Bruce. We were looking to build a younger population involving local agencies who could form a network for communications on the island when all else fails. After three months of meetings at St. John's Rescue Headquarters every other week to cover the material, students took the test on May 6th, with 16 people earning a tech license and two earning a general class license. Another round of classes are expected to start in early August. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. 
UBA is reporting the Belgian regulator, BIPT, is consulting on a proposal to restrict amateur radio access to the 433.050 to 434.790 megahertz spectrum in such a way that it will hardly be usable anymore. BIPT proposes an outright ban on amateur packet, ATV, DATV in that segment, and draconian restrictions on other modes, such as FM, which could be restricted to ultra-low power, just 10 milliwatts, and a low transmit duty cycle, just 30 seconds of transmit time in three minutes. The aim seems to be to protect license-exempt consumer short-range devices from interference. It appears BIPT considers car key fobs, garage door remote controls, temperature sensors, and lighting remote controls are of such importance that amateur radio operations must be dramatically curtailed. The National Society, the UBA, point out that in the Royal Decree on Private Radio Communications and the Rights for Use for Fixed Networks and Networks with Shared Resources, Article 19 states, the frequencies used by short-range equipment and equipment using ultra-wideband technology are allocated on an unprotected basis. In other words, this equipment must not disturb us, primary users, and does not have any right to protection against eventual disruption by us. The UBA says it will naturally oppose this proposal with all its might. The deadline for public responses to the consultation is June 17th. An amateur radio-based science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM, initiative at an Arizona elementary school culminated on May 22nd as youngsters competitively deployed their own radio control rovers to explore a simulated planet set up in a Sonoran desert. Following in the footsteps of NASA scientists, 25 pupils at Baus Elementary School, several already holding ham radio licenses, took part in the APS Arizona Rover Project, which is aimed at promoting STEM subjects through amateur radio and preparing young participants to earn an amateur radio license. It was awesome, said David Anderson, K1AN, the president of My La Paz, which sponsored the project in cooperation with Arizona Public Service and community volunteers. The youth all had the chance to explore the artificial planet, the event was well attended, and the radio links for remote control and video were rock solid. The APS Arizona Rover Project was part of a five-month-long in-curriculum education program at Baus Elementary that Anderson hopes to expand to other schools in La Paz County. Its primary goal was to lift up and inspire the youth into science and learning via instruction and exploration of radio science, amateur radio, and space research, Anderson told ARRL. The goals of the program were to deliver science instruction that met and exceeded Arizona Common Core educational guidelines and to help the youngsters prepare to attain their amateur radio licenses. Anderson said 23 students got their technician licenses while also learning and developing electronic circuits, breadboarding, and more within the school day. Leading up to launch day, participants were challenged to complete different missions using only amateur radio technology for remote control, data, and video feeds. In a manner similar to what the Mars rover scientists do, the students had to complete these missions from a remote location without actually being able to see their robots. Rovers competed in several categories. These included completing specific objectives remotely from mission control and safely returning to their landing vehicle in an allocated time using only a computer interface with their amateur radio. Anderson said first place winners in their respective categories included Elijah Jagrup, KI7IZL, Christina Baker, KI7WOI, and Savannah Holden. Seven radio amateurs mentor in the youth-led Arizona Amateur Radio Association, AZARA. In addition to Anderson, they include Joe Llewellyn, K7JEL, Darren Duffin, NU7X, Neil Hayes, W6FOG, Alexander Fulcher, N4SVD, Paul DeLong, KD7KEL, and Heather Caton, W8GEM, an educator who teaches amateur radio in the schools as part of the curriculum. 
A unique facet of my La Paz is its focus on amateur radio, Anderson said, because of what it can offer the county's young people in sparsely populated La Paz County, where many families live at the poverty level. In many ways, amateur radio has become the students' first social media, since many of their homes have no computers or internet access, he told ARRL. It no longer matters where a youth lives or their family income. They can now participate in learning opportunities or making new social connections and friends via the Desert Amateur Radio Network. The number of students now licensed across La Paz County is approaching 100. The students of this generation are fascinated by space exploration and robotics, Anderson said, and the Rover Project provides a way to let them explore this with radio science and be inspired into learning while making science fun. Anderson said more information, including a Rover block diagram, schematics, parts lists, sources, and the source code is available on the AZARA website. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, K2CT, on 145.19 MHz in New Scotland, New York, owned and operated by the Albany Amateur Radio Association. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.